The elasticity of demand that we're talking about, that we've been talking about up to now, is written EX comma PX. It's it describes how the quantity demanded of X changes when the price of X changes. It's sometimes called the own price elasticity of demand. Or you could say the own price elasticity of demand for X. Where the word own refers to the fact that you're asking how does the demand for X change when its own price, namely PX, changes, not when some other price changes. I mentioned that we're going to be studying other kinds of elasticities, and the next one is denoted EX comma I. It's the income elasticity. Or you can say the income elasticity or demand for X. The formula for it is percent change in the quantity demanded of X divided by the percent change in income. So in the denominator we don't have a price change, now we have an income change. It's useful in this context to think about angle curves. So you recall that an angle curve had income on the horizontal axis and quantity demanded on the vertical axis and had some sort of some sort of shape like follows with an angle curve graph w the the cause is where it, it is in mathematics and other disciplines the cause is on the horizontal axis and the effect is on the vertical axis. As I said, this is the usual case. In supply and demand, economists have it switched because of what Marshall did. But since this is the usual case, our notion for the a measure of the sensitivity of demand for X which is the effect to changes in income, which is the cause, one measure would simply be the change in x over the change in income, which is the slope of the angle curve. So one measure of the sensitivity of demand for X to changes in income is the slope of the angle curve. Clearly that is different from this. Because the second is an elasticity. It's not gonna it's gonna be free of dimensions. The first delta X over delta I is gonna have dimensions of let's say pounds of apples divided by dollars of income. But the second, just like all elasticities, is going to be dimensionless. So that's why that's why it's useful. Now let's think about normal and inferior goods. You will recall that the definition of a normal good is that when income increases, let me write that a little bit better, then consumption goes up. As the definition of an inferior good is that when income increases, then consumption goes down. So let's see what the income elasticity does in these two cases. With a normal good, percent change in quantity demanded of X divided by the percent change in income. Suppose the percent change in income was positive, then you'd be buying more X, and so the percent change in the quantity demanded of X would also be positive, and so this thing 
would be greater than zero. Whereas if it were an inferior good, let's write down the definition again, percent change quantity demanded of x divided by the percent change in income. If the percent change in income were positive, so income went up, then with an inferior good, quantity demanded of x would go down. So the percent change in quantity demanded of x would be a negative number, and so this would be negative. Hence, income elasticity is positive for normal goods, and it's negative for inferior goods. Let's, let's sketch that in the number line. And this is e x comma i, the income elasticity. Normal goods have positive income elasticities, and inferior goods have negative income elasticities. Okay. Another division of commodities that we talked about when discussing income were luxuries and necessities. The definition of a luxury is that if you have, for example, a 10% increase in income, then you had a more than 10% increase in consumption. Whereas with necessities, if you had a 10% increase in income, then you had a less than 10% increase in consumption. Let's think about the elasticity of a luxury. The income elasticity, x comma i, is percent change in the quantity demanded of x divided by the percent change in income. So if you have a 10%, a plus 10% increase in income, if it's a luxury, then consumption rises by more than 10%. So this numerator is greater than 10. So the whole thing is greater than 1. Whereas if you have a necessity, then the income elasticity, percent change in quantity demanded of x divided by percent change in income, if you had a plus 10 percent change in income, you'd have a less than 10 percent increase in the quantity demanded of x. You might even have a fall in the quantity demanded of x. So this thing is going to be less than 10, so the whole thing is going to be less than 1. So the number 1 for income elasticity serves as the dividing point between luxuries and necessities. So up here on the number line, if I now put the number 1 in here, then everything bigger than 1 is a luxury, and everything less than 1 is a necessity. So this is a way of comparing inferior and normal on the one hand, and luxuries and necessity on the other hand, using income elasticity. So you can see you can do the same kind of exercises that we did before. You can see that luxuries have to be normal goods, but a normal good doesn't have to be a luxury. A normal good can also be a necessity. If the income elasticity, for example, were plus one half, then it'd be normal. That would be that'd be this point here. Then it'd be a normal good, but it'd also be a necessity. All inferior goods are necessities, but not all necessities are inferior goods. Some necessities are normal goods. So that's some of the usefulness that we can put income elasticity to. In the next lesson, we'll describe the last type of elasticity we're going to study.